right, here we go. Uh, this is another lecture in Texas history. Uh, as we continue our march through Texas geography with uh, anecdotes and stories about the localities along Texas rivers or other uh, formations, uh, we're going to look for a bit at uh, the city of San Antonio and uh, its in sitting, setting there on the San Antonio River. Originally called the Leon or Leon River, I suppose. Uh, my Spanish has never been very good, so apologies if I mispronounce it. It has an accent over the E. Uh, but the uh, San Antonio River is, in a sense, the lifeblood of the city of San Antonio and is, in many respects, what it is identified with, along with, of course, the Alamo. Uh, but when we talk about the city of San Antonio and the San Antonio River, uh, the river itself actually runs all the way down to basically the coast and it goes into a confluence with the Guadalupe, uh, and then on into the Gulf of Mexico at what, uh, not Copano Bay, it's uh, on, that's not Aransas Bay, I'd like to say it's San Antonio Bay. Anyways, down there at the coast, uh, but it, dry, it, it flows all the way through that uh, prairie territory uh, down around Victoria and Goliad. And I, th I want to say this uh, while I'm thinking about it, now if it's uh, something I've said, I'll repeat it again in several ways uh, in the next few lectures. The uh, territory south and east of San, Antor San Antonio headed toward the coast. Uh, some of you have driven that route from San Antonio to Corpus Christi on I-37, but more particularly for us, we're thinking about that uh, land around Goliad, uh, over around Carn City, over around Victoria and what have you. All that territory through there is really some of the great grasslands of Texas, some of the great prairie lands of Texas. Uh, driving along, say, Highway 77 between Corpus Christi and Victoria, and you would cross both the Guadalupe of Victoria and the San Antonio close to Tivoli, uh, or at least in a general area but uh, around Tivoli and Refugio. Uh, if you, th you drive through there and you say, well, there's a whole lot of trees. Well, a lot of those trees have been planted by birds who have perched upon barbed wire fences. And if you actually look at the uh, ground, there wouldn't have been near in, say, uh, the eight, in 1800 or 1830 or whenever, but uh, say 200 years ago, there would not have been nearly as many trees in those open prairies. It was great grassland. It was great rangeland. Uh, and in all actuality, and I'll probably talk more about this in a separate lecture, the beginnings of the Texas cattle uh, industry and the cattle kingdom, uh, it takes place there in uh, the the uh, southeastern part, uh, well, what we'll call south and south, I guess south central, or but the coastal plains of Texas. Anyways, that's where the great uh, cattle kingdoms began, and it was Spanish, not uh, Anglos or Americans, who were going to begin the cattle kingdom. It's not the King Ranch. Anyways, uh, but for us, we're most interested in San Antonio and along this river, or these little, uh, the headwaters of the San Antonio River. Uh, San Antonio itself is uh, started not as a principal city, but as a stopover point on the road to East Texas. Uh, this will be fleshed out more in a later lecture, but the thing is, is that uh, the Spaniards in the early 1700s and uh, basic late 1600s and especially the early 1700s are going to come to the conclusion that they need to secure their frontier against French uh, incursions in about 1710, 1720 territory. And so what they do, and the Spanish had been nosing around Texas, they'd claimed it since 1519, of course, but uh, the Spanish are uh, moving around Texas in the early 1700s, uh, and they uh, establish a road. Uh, it's also known as uh, El Camino Real, the Royal Road. Uh, sometimes you'll see it in more Anglo terms as the San Antonio Road or the Nacogdoches Road. Uh, if you're from San Antonio, you see uh, Nacogdoches Highway. That's essentially it. And this trail, it's not really a dedicated road. It does not have meets and bounds like we would. Uh, it does not have right-of-ways like a, a modern highway does. But El Camino Real is the major road that travels from essentially the Rio Grande or Rio Bravo uh, there heading into Mexico, to, to us, Mexico, uh, and heading into East Texas around Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches, Louisiana, all that territory up that one. The Spanish, uh, and again, this is uh, more detail for a later lecture, but just simply said, the Spanish will have established missions and presidios in East Texas around Nacogdoches, or, or Nacogdoches will be established around those presidios and missions in the early 1700s and the mid-1700s to colonize and missionize uh, the Indians or the Catoans of East Texas and turn them into good Spanish settlers and taxpayers. Uh, the trip from the Rio Grande all the way to East Texas, whether that's over around Marshall or over around Nacogdoches, is a long way by foot or horseback from East Texas all the way to the Rio Grande. Uh, there's just a whole lot of territory to travel. 
uh, that's a hard, uh, hard thing to do if you're trying to establish a frontier and establish a, a society uh, or at least uh, some settlement uh, in a barren part of the world. And I don't mean like there's no grass or anything, but I mean there is no there's no close neighbors. I mean, you're really uh, taking, going out and planting, as it were, uh, your flag. You're planting your ideas of what you want the future to look like by going into East Texas. Well, uh, it's, uh, I believe I looked it up one time, it's about 350 miles or so from the Rio Grande to East Texas. It's not a short distance, obviously much longer because of uh, the you know travel methods been the time. Uh, roads are non-existent. Even when you have the Royal Road laid out or El Camino Real laid out, uh, it will actually meander and move 20 miles here, 20 miles there. It's, it's not a, a dedicated path. And um, so uh, the thing is, is that... Uh, you, you have to have some stopover points and San Antonio is going, or the city of San Antonio, as we call it, is going to be established in about 1718 as one of the major stopover points in the uh, entirety of, uh, well, one of the major stopover points on the El Camino Real. The reason being is, is it had several things going for it. One, the climate was decent. Uh, it wasn't overly humid. The mosquitoes were not horrible, uh, especially when you're in the foothills or nestled into the foothills of the, of the hill country or the Balcones Escarpment. Uh, in addition to that, you're also going to look at San Antonio, and the bigger issue is they've got abundant water. Lots and lots of good water flowing out of that Edwards Aquifer uh, th through springs and into the rivers and the creeks that feed through the heart of today's San Antonio. Uh, they've got plenty of water. And so you can water your horses, water your cattle, and you can uh, easily or relatively easily establish a, a community there uh, in what we call San Antonio. You're going to have, uh, in this territory we call San Antonio, you're going to have presidios and missions. And then, of course, the town itself is a via, V-I-L-L-A, a via. Uh, the town is the Via de Bejar. And so for us, uh, we, call, we think of it as Bear County, uh, but it's the Bejar. It's, that's what they called it. And they were called Bejarinos or Bejarinas. Uh, they were not called San Antonians until the uh, early to mid-19th century, especially after the Anglos showed up. But the fact was is that the, even into this Texas Revolution and shortly thereafter, you will hear people referring to what we would call San Antonio. They call it Bejar. The Bejarinos do this and the Bejarinas do that and so forth and so on. So abundant water, which is uh, always for civilization, always a major concern, especially before the advent of electricity, piping, and uh, modern plumbing. Uh, so if you're going to build a town, you need to be able to get water to it so people can live. And so that made it, made it easy. Uh, it is nestled into the heart of Comancheria, which we'll discuss in a later lecture, but they caused some problems there. San Antonio in the Mexican period of Texas history is going to be really the principal city in Texas. Uh, in the Mexican period of Texas history, uh, there's really three major settlements in Texas. Uh, first is San Antonio, the largest, and then you have La Bahia, which we call Goliad, uh, and they call Goliad late in its existence, uh, during the Mexican period anyways, and then of course Nacogdoches, and you have smaller settlements there around. But Bejar, uh, uh, or San Antonio, was always heavily Hispanic up until the 1850s and so on. Uh, you start to see more and more Anglos move into and around San Antonio, and about the same time in the 1850s and especially 60s, you'll see more and more Germans, as I've already said in a previous lecture, moving into and around San Antonio. San Antonio actually was, has been a fairly diverse city, uh, partially just because of the uh, traffic coming up out of Mexico, coming up, up off the coast. Uh, it's uh, political importance. At times it is a, a capital city or at least a hub. Uh, even if it's not officially the capital of the Spanish province of Texas, it acts as such. You have a governor there uh, or governors live in San Antonio. Prominent families uh, will live there. And so Bejar, or San Antonio, is, uh, has a long history, and more particularly, it has a very important history as far as political activity, uh, economic activity, and so forth. But as you get into the uh, period of Texas history defined by American statehood and, uh, say, the, Confederate, uh, the brief period of time that Texas is a part of the Confederacy, the fact is, is that Bejar or San Antonio starts to be uh, starts to lag behind uh, some of its other towns and cities in Texas, some of its sisters in Texas, as it were. 
Uh, as we've discussed, Galveston, by the time you get to 1900, Galveston is the premier city in Texas, and of course the hurricane destroys that. Uh, the, there was never really the argument in the late 19th and early 20th century as to which would be the next great city of Texas, and no one argued, let me say this better, no one argued that it would be Behar. No one argued it would be San Antonio that I really saw. That's not to say you didn't have 100,000 people living there or 200,000 people living there around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, you remember this, just San Antonio is a much smaller t uh, town and so is Texas. It's a much smaller populated state at 1900 than it is the year 2000 or certainly 2020. But anyways, uh, the argument always was, is it Dallas or Waco or Austin or Houston? Uh, and then, of course, as I keep saying, Galveston was, uh, was going to be the other one, but not San Antonio. San Antonio is made, uh, not livable, but San Antonio has a, it has a lifeline thrown to it actually in the 19th century, but it is enhanced by the two world wars. If you know uh, San Antonio well enough, and if you've lived around San Antonio long enough, you should be aware of, or you should know that there are multiple military bases, uh, arm, uh, excuse me, armed service, armed, armed force bases in and around San Antonio. Uh, what are they called now? Joint, uh, joint mission bases, that's not right. But anyways, I will still refer to them as the Air Force Base or a, a Army Post or what have you. Fort Sam Houston uh, in the heart of San Antonio is the first to be established. In fact, actually the U.S. Army uh, for a while in the 1850s is going to have, and even shortly after it, is going to have the Alamo Complex uh, the Alamo in downtown San Antonio is going to be used as a, uh, a warehouse for wagons and other sorts of things. So uh, the Alamo was not initially turned into a shrine to Texas history. That's in its own right an interesting story. Uh, that takes place in the early 20th century when the, the uh, daughters of the Republic of Texas uh, protect the Alamo from uh, bulldozing, essentially, or not being knocked down. Well, anyways, uh, the thing is, is that when you talk about San Antonio, you had Fort Sam Houston, you'll have Randolph Air Force Base, uh, you'll also have Brooks Air Force Base, Lackland Air Force Base. Some of you might have friends who joined uh, the Air Force right out of high school, maybe you did, and you went to Lackland for your training there for your basic training. Known many people who did. In addition to that, uh, for a long time, and it's been closed about 20, maybe 30 years at this point, uh, closer to 30 at this point, I guess, is uh, Kelly Air Force Base. And that was on the west side, and that was a major, major employer. And the reason I bring all this up is, is when you talk about the city of San Antonio and what was it that made it go uh, prior to the modern era, is what made San Antonio valuable and gave people jobs uh, and allowed other things to flourish around, the, around it, it was the military. And really, you could say to leave even better, uh, the government. The government, uh, the federal government especially, provided lots and lots of jobs for the city of San Antonio. And many San Antonians in the 19th and especially uh, most of the 20th century, or at least until, say, 1980 or so. Actually, it was 1990. Uh, that date, you'd remember, 1990. Until about 1990, San Antonio's major employer was the government. And so, I mean, most of it was military or military related, but there's post office and this, that, and the other. So San Antonio has a, uh, has a very close connection to the federal government in the form of jobs and economic security. Then about 1990, uh, it's kind of one of those official things, kind of, it probably took place in 88 or so, but about 1990, San Antonio's main economic driver, and in many respects is this to this day, the, uh, it is the, um, San Antonio's economic driver is tourism. And some of you who are from the San Antonio area know exactly what I mean. And uh, with the virus that we're, we have endured, one of the problems, of course, for a city like San Antonio is, is that a lot of tourists either can't or won't uh, go traveling like they normally would. They won't get into their truck or their car or get on a plane and fly to San Antonio and take up a residence for a couple of days in the River Center uh, Marriott. Uh, they won't stay in Palacio del Rio or anything of that nature. But for San Antonio, the great economic driver after 1990, and frankly beforehand, was or is tourism. Just think how many thousands and thousands of tourists come to San Antonio each year for the various and sundry things. 
that they, the city puts on to draw people in and drive its economic engine. I mean, you've got Fiesta, which is in right around April 21st with uh, famously the Battle of Flowers Parade, which is the older of the two main uh, parades, but uh, Fiesta Flambeau. How many uh, uh, Texans go to San Antonio over that weekend to go see those parades, spend money either through VRBO in a modern sense, Airbnb, again, modern hotel, motel sorts, uh, sorts of things, or if they just stay with family and then go out to eat at, say, uh, Oh, uh, La Fonda on Main or some other great place like that, or, or uh, say Casa Rio. I'm just thinking of two great Tex-Mex places. But Or even just go across, maybe not go Tex-Mex, you go across the street to the Pearl Brewery, which I haven't been into since they've redone it. But evidently at, that, uh, at the time of this recording, that is one of the more hip, I use maybe Cosmopolitan, but certainly it is a tourist attraction with uh, artisan-type foods and such. So anyways, you've got a lot of options in San Antonio to go spend money, and they're glad to, for you to spend the money. So uh, San Antonio has uh, Fiesta, which I've just mentioned. It's around the time of the Texas, uh, in, uh, Texas uh, uh, independence, and more particularly the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, of course, people will come to San Antonio for, um, oh gosh, Fiesta Texas, SeaWorld, and so on. And uh, obviously, if you're talking about San Antonio, what is the greatest tourist attraction in the city? Uh, normally, it still is the Alamo. Uh, oftentimes, it kind of fluctuates from year to year a little bit. Uh, but oftentimes the greatest uh, at attraction to pe uh, for people in San Antonio is going to be, or rather bring them to San Antonio is the Alamo, and then right down the road from there is the River Center Mall. That's also a big one. The River Center Mall may end up being one of the few malls that survives the great change in the United States. Uh, maybe the Mall of America in Minneapolis would be another uh, exception to the rule. But most malls are, are closing and dying because who goes to a mall when you can order it from Amazon and it ships to you? Uh, but when you're down in San Antonio, you're going to stick your head in the River Center at least a little bit. But uh, also, it's fair to say, too, what's also the other major tourist uh, attraction in San Antonio? And you're thinking, well, why haven't you said the Riverwalk? Well, it is the Riverwalk. And so the Riverwalk is uh, that other big one. So I guess we should t uh, spend just a moment talking about the Riverwalk. The Riverwalk isn't a product of, of late 20th century Texas. In fact, actually, like many other things, as I've already said in San Antonio, it is a child of the government. By that, I mean the federal government. In the late 1930s, uh, the New Deal uh, administration, or the Roosevelt administration, which was administering the New Deal, is going to hand out or ladle out money, as I've said repeatedly in these lectures, whether it's through Lyndon Johnson or other individuals in the state of Texas. And to be clear, not all the money that comes to Texas in the New Deal goes through Lyndon Johnson, just, just a part of it does. But uh, say like the State Fair of Texas, as I've said before, was a... Um, a product of the New Deal. It was built by the New, New Deal money, basically. Uh, there was some state contributions, but those are always uh, secondary and sometimes negligible. In the case of San Antonio, the Riverwalk was built by the New Deal. Memory serves it was a public works administration project, but it may have been works progress administration. Those are two uh, organizations that are within the U.S. government uh, designed to build buildings and put artisans to work and so on. Uh, anyways, either one could, I, I, again, without me having my note right in front of me, uh, but it was built in about, started in about 1937. Now, part of the reason it gets underway, and there had been a push to turn downtown San Antonio into a tourist attraction and also to uh, upgrade and to build San Antonio and to make it greater or make it something that people would want to come to, whether to live there, uh, open a business there, or to visit and spend money as a tourist, uh, that had been a goal of some, for some time. Prior to the Riverwalk, prior to the development of the modern downtown San Antonio street scene and the river scene that you, so many of you have walked and know, uh, the thing is, is that the city of San Antonio, uh, the river running through the heart of San Antonio was a dump. You can put that in your notes. You can write the word dump. It was an open cesspool. Uh, quite honestly, a lot of straight pipes ran out of uh, houses in the late 19th and into the early 20th century, and frankly, well before the late 19th century. But the what we call the San Antonio River in its natural state looks nothing like what you've seen and walked along. Now, some of you walk along it, and maybe your family have a soft spot in your heart for the river walk because maybe mom and dad uh, met at the river walk, or that's where they went on their honeymoon, or it was uh, the last time you did this or that with grandma and grandpa. I mean, whatever the case may be, some people have a soft spot in their heart for the river walk, and, and 
I'm one of those individuals, but I'm not going to lie to you and say that the river walk is, or at least the river itself is always the cleanest and purest looking water in the world, especially when you've just gone through, say, the Alamo Bowl or Fiesta or some other great uh, in, uh, infiltration or great uh, inundation uh, by tourists. Uh, the water in the San Antonio River looks ugly and foul because it frankly kind of is you got all those boats going up and down it and churning it up it just is uh un frankly sometimes unsightly uh i don't want to make it sound like it's a cuyahoga river in cleveland and it's about to catch on fire because it's not but most of that water it is fair to say in its this presentation today as you see it today that water basically is out of the Edwards Aquifer. The city of San Antonio, through its water system, SAWS, San Antonio Water System, SAWS pumps millions of gallons of water into that uh, river channel to keep the, uh, the river at a constant level, to keep it, uh, uh, you know, attractive for the tourist. You, you want to make a presentation. But in pre-New uh, Deal, pre-Riverwalk times, it was just essentially a, a ditch. It was uh, a kind of looked like a small creek. It flowed, maybe flowed a little bit, a uh, lot when it rained. Maybe if the, uh, the water was high in the Edwards, it flowed a lot more, but it, it flowed. But it was never accused of being uh, on the same level as the Mississippi, the Brazos, or any other of the uh, more substantial rivers in and around Texas. But, uh, and that was part of the problem. Also, you, like I said, you're going to have locals, they're going to put their uh, public drain pipes if you know what I mean, coming out of the house. They're going to put their public drain pipes uh, into the river, and that'll help flow it too, flow off the waste. And so it was a stinking foul mess. And on top of that, prior to, put this in your notes, 1921, I, year should, have, uh, should be ringing a bell with you again, 1921, it is uh, prone to flooding. And I say prior to 1921, it's really about 1925 when it's finished. But downtown San Antonio is pr uh, prone to flooding. So it's really kind of ugly. It's foul. It's nasty, dirty. You've got trash in it at t places, tires thrown into it, uh, broke up rocks and rubble. I mean, it just seems like uh, it's, it's nothing compared to what you've seen today is my point. The things that start to turn the downtown San Antonio away from its old presentation of an open sewer pit to the uh, river walk as we see it today uh, really actually begin in 1921, and that is a, a big deal. If you have traveled along the banks, or rather you've traveled along uh, the river walk in one of those uh, open boat, you know, tr uh, you know, I guess barges that they uh, uh, push, I've been on them ha probably half a dozen times in my life uh, with uh, Gloria and Caroline and other family members and such. It's a nice little, you know, what, 20 minute uh, river walk uh, tour and so forth. It's pretty cool. I've enjoyed it. Uh, but anyways, you go along it and they used to, uh, at least uh, years ago, they don't do it so much now. I haven't seen it in a while, but they used to point out this tree that was uh, hanging out of the side of a building and it was a full grown tree and maybe it's been cut down. And it's no longer there. But this tree that was way up in there in the side, built, grown out of the side of a building, uh, you wonder how the heck did it get in there? And when I say up the side of a building, about 10 feet above the, uh, the water line, 10 feet above the bank level. What had happened was that 1921, uh, we talked about 1921, the flood at Thrall that, that dropped 36 inches in 18 hours. Uh, it was a little old tiny hurricane that it didn't rain here at Snook, which is only a few... 50, 60, 50 miles away from Thrall. It didn't rain a drop here, yet it dropped so much rain at Thrall and it flooded out the Brazos River on the dry flood. It also rained at San Antonio. Like I said in the lecture, it came in at Brownsville, took a beeline northward, went over San Antonio, and then blew its, uh, blew its guts out over Thrall. Overnight, uh, basically the night, bef night of, and then it's about more or less the same day that they, uh, it, it rained all over Thrall, it rains about 12 inches or so just north of downtown San Antonio, up around Alamo Stadium, up around 281 north, up, say, 410 in that territory through there. For those of you who have been to San Antonio and know the ro roadways, you got little hills, and if you uh, drive 281 North there at Alamo Stadium, you look off to your right toward Incarnate Word uh, University or the University of the Incarnate Word, you can see how it's uh, a decline and it's a recess. That's, that's a creek bottom. That's what the Almas Creek, I believe. And then you've got uh, the same sort of thing on the, the west side of Trinity University heading in toward downtown. My point is this. All of that water is going to go and channel into what is the beginnings of the San Antonio River, and they channel right through the heart of downtown San Antonio. 
But if you're traveling up 281 north and you get past UIW and you get past Trinity, he headed northward toward uh, the quarry, off to your right, headed northward, off to your right, there is a big dam sitting there, and it's called the Almas Dam, O-L-M-O-S, the Almas Basin. Well, that dam was built in the mid-1920s to protect downtown after it was flooded in 1921. In 1921, it flooded out, killed a whole bunch of people, killed several hundred people in downtown San Antonio who were living in shanties uh, and uh, right on the river, so many of them very poor. Uh, but anyways, all that to say is, is that it is um, it's not good. Uh, it, it was a, a disaster for San Antonio and wrecked out San Antonio businesses. Uh, it was a, a first-class uh, disaster. And so afterwards, the city made the determination, starting with the Almas Dam, that they were going to protect downtown and protect it almost at any cost because they understood uh, in a basic sense that you had to protect that downtown uh, region. That's your central business district. Eventually becomes your tourist district and becomes your economic engine. So you start with the Almas Dam, and then you go with other flood control projects, uh, in, uh, capping out in the late uh, 20th century with a ambitious and successful building of a bunch of, uh, they sunk a bunch of um, channels, or I should say canals, enclosed canals underneath downtown, and it really worked in 1998, which was a big flood in San Antonio there as well. San Antonio, Seguin, it was all that rain that flowed down the Guadalupe in, in a previous lecture. But it rained in San Antonio heavily, Seguin heavily, uh, Gu uh, New Braunfels heavily, the 98 flood, which uh, some of you have f family that lived through. But anyways, uh, all that water goes underneath San Antonio's downtown district and comes back into the uh, San Antonio River Channel south of downtown and then flows onto the Gulf of Mexico. That, too, was uh, financed partially by the U.S. government. So uh, the, the indication, and sometimes we talk about this in the form of history making changes to a, a city's future in the form of Galveston being never the same again, the form of Corpus Christi in 1919 and later years becoming a, a big deep-sea port and a city of, uh, of consequence. The same can be said for San Antonio is, is this hurricane, uh, this great rain event. It really wasn't the wind, it was the water. Uh, the rain of that hurricane has started the transformation of San Antonio from basically being a uh, kind of a backwater city uh, in Texas that people had preconceived notions about it being just basically uh, the Alamo and nothing more uh, to being starting to become a city. Uh, it goes further, and the Riverwalk really starts to take off as a specific and dedicated event because of the efforts of people who were uh, city boosters. The Chamber of Commerce in San Antonio has been very active. You had very prominent individuals who were in favor of this and pushed the government to spend money on the Riverwalk in the late 1930s, one of which is also a name you need to put in your notes. His name is Mari, M-A-U-R-Y, Mari Maverick. Now, Mari Maverick was a congressman from San Antonio in the early to mid-1930s, 1934, 35 territory, and I think even 30, through 36, 37. Uh, congressman Maverick later becomes Mayor Maverick. Uh, he was a lefty's lefty. He was a progressive's progressive. He was a liberal's liberal. And so I guess what I'm saying is if you think Texas has not had a progressive streak in it over the years, uh, it's not been as prominent as, say, Berkeley and San Francisco and in California. It's never been as prominent as what you get in some places in New York or uh, Massachusetts or elsewhere. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin comes to mind. Uh, but there have been pockets in Texas and occasions in Texas history where you've had some fairly radical voices get elected to public office. And Mari Maverick was one of them. He himself said, I hope to outnew the New Deal the New Deal. Basically, uh, that's him. And uh, if you've ever heard the word gobbledygook, that was Mari Maverick. Uh, he was a rambunctious, almost uh, gadfly-like politician. He had his opinions, and he wasn't afraid to share them, and he had his principles, and he wasn't afraid to share those others. And those sorts of politicians don't normally last too long because they tend to get fired, or meaning not reelected, because they tend to offend too many people, especially in a somewhat, at times, conservative state. Uh, but in the 1930s, people were willing to listen to Amari Maverick and then elect him at times when, say, in 1950s or two, 1990s, they would never have touched him with a 10-foot pole. Uh, he was right for the times. But anyways, Mayor Maverick uh, also was an old-line San Antonian. 
Uh, the Mavericks go back to the earliest, some of the earliest days of San Antonio's uh, history, or at least said better, uh, they were some of the earliest Anglo settlers, some of the earliest Anglo residents of San Antonio de Bejar. And you will find Mayor uh, the Mavericks, uh, you will find that name Maverick on documents in the Republic of Texas. You'll find it in the Revolutionary Period. Uh, the Maverick family goes way, way back in San Antonio history. Now, Mayor Maverick, as I understand the story, also he lived pretty close to downtown. I don't think he lived in downtown, but he, uh, maybe that King William district, if you know that territory pretty well, kind of the old, old money in San Antonio. Anyways, uh, Mayor Maverick, uh, he would tie one on occasionally. He'd go drink a little bit, and there were bars in downtown San Antonio. And uh, this is before the river walk. While he's a congress may, congressman, may have already been a mayor at that point of San Antonio, but he went and he went uh, walking home, and well, nature called after drinking too many cold ones. And uh, so he went to, to take care of uh, the call of nature, and he stumbled over a whole bunch of trash and fell into that uh, sewer pit, or excuse me, that river, uh, the San Antonio. Well, supposedly he also that helped convince him to get behind the project if he needed convincing, anyways. Uh, and so, this, whatever the uh, the exact uh, reason is, whoever was the the main driving force, uh, the San Antonio Riverwalk gets born. And so, in the 1930s, you start to see it built. It's uh, the first phase is completed in the 1940s. Uh, Casa Rio uh, and Chilo's Delicatessen are some of the first. Uh, businesses, especially Casa Rio, to be opened along the Riverwalk and act as a restaurant slash uh, eatery on the Riverwalk. And then, of course, it expands out from there to what you see today, which is far, far greater as far as uh, uh, size and concept than it was in its initial stages. But like most things in life, you start, you start with the be beginnings and you go past. So the city of San Antonio grows. Uh, today, the city of San Antonio is what, about 1.3 million individuals, something like that. I said that in a previous lecture in the, the 2018 estimate. The thing is much, much bigger, and uh, San Antonio isn't just tourism either. And so I should uh, hasten to add that. The, the real change in t late 20th and early 21st century uh, San Antonio happens to be that you see uh, other businesses move in. USAA is a major employer. Uh, I say that as I'm looking over my shoulder at my email. I just saw USAA send me an email saying you need to do this and that. So USAA is a major employer. Uh, AT&T has been a major employer. Toyota, and some of you may have a family member, maybe you yourself drive a Toyota Tundra. And if you are a proud Texan and you only and you are looking to buy Texas made things like an I think Arctic coolers are made in Texas still. But if you want to buy a Texas made truck, you need to go down to uh, your Toyota dealership, which is a Japanese uh, owned company. But the Toyota Tundra, some of you know, is made in San Antonio, Texas. And my father has a to Tundra. It's a great, great vehicle. All right, so where I'm going with all this is, is that, the say, Toyota, for example, they have their version of the King Ranch uh, model truck. King Ranch is a Ford issue. Uh, the King Ranch we know about from South Texas and the great cattle drives. But if you, you see a Toyota Tundra and you see on the, the nameplate on the side, it's going to say 1794. The 1794 Toyota is a Toyota that is top of the line, being the uh, creme de la creme. You're not going to use that Toyota 1794 to haul too many things besides a few uh, sacks of uh, cattle feed and maybe a few thises or thats. Now, it's got a good motor in it, and it will pull. But that 1794 to the history, the 1794 is a reference to the Spanish land grant that was granted to, uh, I, I don't know the name of the family, but was granted to a family uh, to set up shop outside of San Antonio, then San Antonio, uh, to Bejar, or just simply Bejar, and to uh, run cattle and so forth. The Toyota Tundra factory in West San Antonio is on at 1794 land grant. And so they took it and used it. So if you see 1794, that's a reference to a Spanish land grant right outside of San Antonio or and, and the Spanish period, just simply Bayhart. Anyhow, uh, all that to say is San Antonio is growing. It's got a far more than just economics in the tourism department or, for that matter, the government. And they're still there. Tourism still is number one. But you see a lot of people, and some of you know folks who, get, uh, who do quite well uh, working for corporations or other industries that are, have relocated to San Antonio or at least opened up branch offices, big ones, in San Antonio in the last 20 or so years. But uh, I want to close my lecture on San Antonio with this little statement here. 
San Antonio it was uh, had a reputation prior to the uh, late 20th century, and it's not a bad reputation, but it was a hindering rep- reputation. The name I'm about to give you is a fellow who j- died just a few years ago. Uh, his name is Red McCombs. Red McCombs was a big car dealer in San Antonio, Austin, other parts of Texas. Red McCombs, at the time of his death, uh, was, I think, worth a couple billion dollars. He was, uh, it left not a couple billion, the high uh, nine figures. Uh, He was a very wealthy man. Red McCombs is a, he was a philanthropist. Uh, He was also a a big-time businessman. He was a philanthropist in the sense that if you go to the to the University of Texas, you will find a good number of buildings named for him because he and his wife, I believe her name was Charlene, uh, are going to give hundreds of thousands, frankly millions of dollars to the University of Texas uh, as far as academics are concerned and also athletics. Uh, Some of you may have played uh, softball in high school uh, and you might have played at the Red McCombs Field, the softball field there at the University of Texas Stadium. Memory serves also there is uh, some uh, at, uh, I believe it's the Incarnate Word, there are some gifts by uh, Red McCombs there uh, to the University of Incarnate Word, but you can check me on that. But you find his fingerprints everywhere. He also owned the Minnesota Vikings in the late 1990s, early, ni- early 2000s, uh, and in addition to that, he also twice owned the San Antonio Spurs. So, to the Spurs, though. Uh, the story I'm about to tell you, I heard personally, back, uh, probably about eight years or so before he passed, but he, McCombs, was invited to speak at the Texas State Historical Convention in San Antonio. This would probably be about 2009, 2010. So when I heard this, I'd have to check the exact date, but that's kind of immaterial for our purposes. Just know I've heard it in, say, the last decade or so. Anyways, uh, McCombs, McCombs, Red McCombs, was speaking at a breakfast, and uh, he got up there, and he was to talk about his collection of Texana items. Uh, He had guns uh, from the 19th century. He had even some cannons from the 19th century. He had this, he had that. Uh, He was kind of, from what I gathered, a bit of a pack rat and a bit of an amateur historian. And uh, his talk on the history side was, uh, it was okay. Nothing to get excited about or anything of that nature. The thing is, is that when it comes to McCombs, um, McCombs is uh, talking about uh, his collections and such, and then he kind of wandered in his lecture uh, onto the subject of San Antonio and the growth of San Antonio. And it was, he was a booster. He was a proud San Antonian, and that's where he made his home. I think he lived in the Dominion, but maybe he lived on a ranch outside of town. I don't know. But he was talking about how San Antonio changed. And, and I, I started to perk up because I find these things interesting in addition to the history of it. Um, he said that what changed San Antonio was the Spurs. And so I perked up a lot, partially because at that time I was a pretty uh, dogged uh, Spurs fan, and it was pretty easy to be a Spurs fan at that point because they'd won four championships in 10 years and, you know, Tim Duncan and all that sort of business, uh, Tony Parker, Ginobili, and the Go Spurs Go thing. And uh, I, I was a basketball fan. Then I'm kind of not so much now. I just don't really care anymore. Uh, that, that's what it boils out to. But I was like, oh, that's interesting. Because I, I, always, have consi- I always thought the selling of uh, sports to, you know, make your town greater and bigger was a bit of a, you know, kind of a con, frankly. When, you, when I hear team owners saying, you need to build me a new stadium, I thought we, I've always defaulted to that's a bunch of Barbara Streisand. Uh, that's just not true. And uh, using San Antonio as an example, I remember in the early 1990s, it was basically said by the city fathers, who San Antonio politics is a little bit um, shady at times, frankly. Uh, It was said by city fathers, a guy named Henry Cisneros particularly, but others who who were like him, and said that if you build the Alamo Dome, the Alamo Dome right off of downtown, you too can have an NFL football stadium. Essentially, 30 years later, the Alamo Dome sits more or less empty 90% of the year, and there's no pro football st- uh, team in it. Not going to be, frankly. So anyways, the Alamo Dome was uh, one of those sorts of build a, build a stadium, and there's going to be an NFL team in your future. And of course, it has not happened. So I was, I'm skeptical. I'm listening to this, and uh, McCombs goes on to make the presentation that uh, it, it mattered a lot that the Spurs won. And what he was saying actually made a lot of sense, and I, I adjusted my thinking because of what McCombs had to say. And he had no reason to, be, to lie or anything like that, so I don't want the, the cynic to jump out and say, ah, you got taken advantage of. I don't think so. 
Uh, but what he basically said, McCombs did in that lecture at the uh, historical convention in San Antonio, was is that San Antonio's reputation prior to the Spurs winning championships and becoming prominently and pro- becoming good in the late 1990s or the 1990s into the 2000s was is that San Antonio's reputation was that of the Alamo. Uh, many of you are familiar with when traveling to other con- other countries and even other states in the federal American Federal Union. You say you're from Texas and you go to Massachusetts, or you say you're from Texas and you go to New Hampshire, let alone France or Japan or something like that. People will ask you and say, do you have electricity in Texas? Do you ride a horse to school in Texas? Do you have oil wells in Texas? Do you have shootouts in the streets all the time? Do you wear a gun? Blah, 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 blah. You, some of you have gotten those questions or all of those questions and others I didn't even ask. San Antonio's problem was is that it wasn't just that it had the Texas uh, stereotype affixed to it, but it had the Alamos uh, stereotype affixed to it. And in the national mind, and that's where I'm really going now, in the national mind, according to Red McCombs, and I have no reason to doubt him, I can believe this, is, is that a lot of people's concept of San Antonio, even as late as the 1980s, was that San Antonio was nothing but a dusty, dirty uh, backwater that had no electricity. Yeah, maybe they've got uh, some people living there, but really their concept the concept of San Antonio stopped with 1836 in the Alamo. Maybe they watched John Wayne's epic film, which is a horrible film anyways. It's really a great comedy uh, about the Alamo. It's, and I say that uh, not sincerely, but sarcastically. It's, he, Wayne, by the way, made the Alamo to be serious, but it's really a comedy how bad it is historically. Anyways, uh, uh, when it comes to the Alamo, that's what they watched. And so they, they kind of froze in the mind of many Americans, and especially those of uh, those corporate types who are going to spend money and maybe set up a business or open up a shop or open up a branch office in San Antonio, it froze in their mind and really just prejudiced, a, a, you know, it prejudiced uh, them against San Antonio and about relocating to San Antonio. But McComb said, and I, I said it was the Spurs, and that's the prim- primary one, but McComb said two things, really. He said sports in general, sports is what opened up San Antonio to the world. Starting in the 1990s, uh, the Spurs got really good. David Robinson, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, uh, Mano Ginobili, and others. And the Spurs start to win, win big. And so they win big, either winning the championship or getting deep into the playoffs. What it did was it forced uh, national media types from New York City, from Los Angeles, from Chicago, and so on, to come to San Antonio to cover the Spurs. And when they went to San Antonio, evidently, just even just by word of mouth, they start coming back to their territories. And these, some of these major media moguls and these major media uh, personalities know folks in high finance, in, in uh, the corporate structures and so forth, and they talked, talked at meetings. They just uh, maybe said it in print, maybe said it on TV or whatever. But basically, well, they came back and said, you know what? San Antonio is a beautiful city. You know what? San Antonio has great weather. Well, it probably weren't there in August, of course, but at the same time, San Antonio is not nearly as humid as Houston, nine times out of ten. And San Antonio does not have horrible winters. I mean, it can get cold in San Antonio, but my gosh, it never snows, basically, except for 1985. And, you know, it, there's no ice storms except once a decade. So, I mean, if you like a mild winter, a hot summer, but you got air conditioning for that, move to San Antonio. Move your business there. People will love to. And, by the way, early, early on, at least, in the 1990s, land and houses were relatively cheap in San Antonio. San Antonio in 1990 uh, was about an 800,000-person city, 850,000. By, ni- oh, by the year 2000, it's right on the cusp of a million. But anyways, all of which is to say is that San Antonio was uh, being reported very positively in uh, social circles and in national media circles because of sports. And it was because of the NCAA Final Fours that were hosted in that Alamo Dome I just criticized a minute ago and because of the Spurs. And when that happened, that opened the door uh, for the city of San Antonio to really start effectively recruiting those new employers, those new businesses, the Toyotas of the world, into San Antonio and convince them San Antonio is a place where you want to put your business. There is opportunity here. There's, uh, we can make money. You can make money. Everybody can uh, wash each other's hands. Uh, and, and I think that was right. And I think, like I said, at the outset, when I heard him uh, launch into this, I was skeptical. But his reasoning, and, and again, I don't think this man was lying. I think he was just being honest, and he had no reason to, uh, to try to uh, 
say things that weren't true or partially true at a history meeting full of professors. Uh, you know, we're not, professors are not going to bring big business to town. But at the same time, I thought it was a very uh, good point. And it's really a, a, an under exp explanation and a historical understanding of why San Antonio went from being a small, out-of-the-way dusty burg uh, supported by the military, then tourism, which probably also, frankly, helped people see that San Antonio was not a backwater. But then the Spurs and their winning takes it to what you see today and some of you come from today. So uh, let's move on past San Antonio. Let's wrap up our discussions on on geography in Texas and what have you. And so uh, San Antonio is done. We can move on. And so uh, the next river up for us is the Nueces River, the Nueces. If you go south of San Antonio or even west of San Antonio down to Corpus Christi, the Nueces River, N-U-E-C-E-S, the Nueces River is the southern boundary of Texas. You need to write that down. I, I like boundaries, and I will put them into my exams from time to time, but one of the boundaries of Texas, one of the southern boundaries of Texas in her history, especially during the Mexican period of Texas history, is the Nueces River. Nueces in Spanish, basically, uh, Nueces kind of gets changed, uh, anglicized a little bit. It was originally called Nuez, N-U-E-Z, which means nuts uh, because of the acorns and the, uh, uh, the essentially the acorns and, and so forth that fell from the trees along the banks of the river. The Nueces starts out around Uvalde, flows south of San Antonio, flows south into the Corpus Christi Bay or Nueces Bay. It's all in the same confluence territory right there, the city of Corpus Christi. Uh, for us, really, the bigger issue isn't what goes on in the river because it's kind of a slow, small, uh, dry river because of where it flows and what it, uh, and it, what it drains. It can flood. It does flood. It has, some major, uh, has one uh, nice-sized lake on it. But when we talk about the Nueces River, Mexico, to be clear, is going to declare the southern boundary of Texas during the period of time which Mexico con controls Texas as the Nueces River. Uh, the southern boundary of Texas from Nueces down to Rio Grande, uh, you can put this also in your notes, is known historically as the Nueces Strip, a strip of land that was at times almost a no man's land, kind of a bandit's haven sort of thing, a pirate's haven even. I, I don't get pirate, it makes it sound you know dramatic, but basically thieves, robbers, vandals, uh, murderers, and other people on the run from the law, uh, kind of a lawless territory, that Nueces Strip. Uh, between Texas, the Republic of Texas, and also later the United States and Mexico, that land between Texas, uh, between the Nueces and the Rio Grande is going to be greatly, greatly contested. Frankly, it's one of the flashpoints in the war between the United States and Mexico in 1846, and it was a flashpoint between Texas, the Republic of Texas, and Mexico during the Republic era. Uh, frankly, also, the Republic of Texas will, is going to claim the Rio Grande as its southern boundary. Mexico never recognized that. And frankly, all, I've said frankly a whole lot. But neither will Mexico recognize the Republic of Texas' right to exist, except until 1845, right at the very end. All of which is to say is, is that what you have right here is a political flashpoint. And that's what I want you to remember. That land south of the Nueces River, south uh, including Corpus Christi, uh, all that land south of the Nueces River is, is a political flashpoint in the Republic of Texas and early Texas statehood in the American Federal Union. So that's why you need to remember it, uh, not for uh, some city story, which I've already told anyways with Corpus Christi or some other little nugget or information. I guess I could pick something out, maybe talk about uh, Uvalde or, or something out there, but I'm not. The uh, last two rivers we're going to look at are going to go rather quickly. Uh, the, the next one is one of the big ones out west, and some of you have driven across it. Some of the greatest and best photography you can take in Texas, uh, just for the scenic vistas, if you've got a really good panoramic pic, uh, camera and all that sort of thing, uh, is to take pictures out around uh, the Pecos River especially the Pecos River at Langtree, which is where it goes, essentially flows into the Rio Grande, uh, right, out, right out west, about 40, 50 miles west of Del Rio. Uh, the Pecos River is, is going to have several names in its history. Just know that, I mean, you don't have to write them down, but Rio de las Vacas, the river, river of cows, the Rio Salado, meaning the, the uh, salty river. Uh, it was said by Spaniards and early uh, 
Spaniards and Mexican uh, and also American settlers or uh, travelers through there that the water in the Pecos was so salty and so sal had so much saline in it that the horses and even cattle wouldn't drink it when they were thirsty. It was that bad. And so they, uh, it has issues. Uh, when we talk about the Pecos River, it really is just kind of a dividing line for us historically between Texas and West Texas. <laughs> I say that West Texas is also considered Lubbock and Amarillo and that part of the world too in the Panhandle. But West Texas, really when I think of West Texas, I think of the Trans-Pecos West which would include the Big Bend Mountains. And if you want to get away from uh, lots of things, you love the mountains, uh, go, sure, go to Colorado, go to Montana. But you also ought to take a trip out to the west and go to the Trans-Pecos out around Fort Davis. Go to the uh, observatory at McDonald's there in Fort Davis, around Fort Davis. Go out to the Big Bend, which is 100 miles away. But out in that part of the world, 100 miles is just like a blip, it seems like. But anyways, you go down to the uh, Big Bend, also some beautiful territory through there, rugged, desolate, and so forth. Uh, two towns worth noting, aside from El Paso, which is a major entry port into the United States, but two small towns worth noting for our little uh, brief lecture about the Trans-Pecos West. So uh, we talk about one, which would be Marfa, and the other would be Alpine. Alpine first, Alpine's home to Sol Ross State University. If you want to go out to a, a, a secluded, a quiet, if you're really kind of a, a country boy at heart, even if you grew up in cities, the fact of the matter is, is that if you move to, um, to uh, Alpine, you move out west to Alpine, you're going to see, be just, uh, uh, if you move to Alpine, you're going to be alone. There's nothing close to it, and maybe Marfa, and that's about it. But if you like that sort of thing, Sol Ross State University might be for you. Also, in addition to uh, Alpine, where Sol Ross is, Marfa is uh, really kind of a, an, a jewel in the desert sort of thing. It's a, kind of the high Chihuahua desert out that part of the world. Marfa, <clears throat> what's noteworthy about Marfa is, of course, you've got a lot of Californians, and there's even a Prada store out there. But a lot of Californians have uh, weekend houses, uh, wealthy Californians, uh, and, and even New Yorkers have wealthy houses in Marfa. It's kind of strange. But the thing that people have always noted about Marfa is the lights, the Marfa lights. And the Marfa lights, you see these green lights that kind of undulate back and forth, left, right, and you really don't know what causes them. Uh, they're kind of like Bailey's lights down in Brazoria County that you don't know what causes them. Some people say they're specters and ghosts. Others say they're uh, gaseous formations out in that part of the world. They have been recorded by some of the, the Native Americans who lived in that part of Texas uh, thousands of years ago. So the Marfa lights um, draw people out in that part of the world. But overall, they don't draw that many. It is a desolate and a, just a, a quiet place. And if you want to get away from uh, the hubbub and the hustle and bustle and you like an isolated experience, well, then Marfa might be for you. West Texas might be for you. It's, it's really the least populated part of the state, and generally speaking, with the exception of uh, wealthy Californians who fly in and fly out, most people do not move to uh, West Texas except for El Paso. So Texas geography is, is diverse, and I didn't even touch on uh, stuff in the panhandle to speak of. I mean, you could talk about Abilene in the big country. You could talk about Lubbock in the High Plains. I guess I ought to say this. On the High Plains, when we talk about Lubbock and Amarillo and all that part there in the panhandle, I really should say this. Uh, those two towns are nice, I think. But the thing is, when you look at Amarillo and you look at Lubbock, a lot, a lot of agriculture up there. One, if you've ever driven through that part of the world, a lot of feedlots. A lot of uh, feedlots for cattle and for pigs to be slaughtered out uh, and put on plates. It uh, slaughtered out or fattened up and then eventually slaughtered out and sent off or sent off and then slaughtered elsewhere. So a lot of feedlots up in, up in that part of the world. Secondly, you have a lot of farming. And now by the time you hear, uh, record this in 2020, you've had 40 or 50 years, maybe a little longer, of dry land farming because you can pump a lot of water out of another one of these aquifers that finds itself in Texas, partially anyways. It's called the Ogallala Aquifer. It's a gigantic aquifer that goes into the Great Plains, but lots and lots of water has been pumped out and uh, made available uh, to turn land around Lubbock, which otherwise couldn't support it, turn it into a, to great cotton farms and other uh, pro produce up there. Again, that's a part of st the state that has uh, largely been depopulating. Most people, most kids who grow up in the panhandle of Texas, I say most, but a lot of them anyways, 
they move away. They don't stay in the small towns and they move out. And if you ever drive through that part of the world, you see that. Those little towns out around Abilene, those little towns outside of Lubbock or Amarillo, they just seem to be places that time passed by and that there's a lot of truth in that. And some of you have family members, and I've had students over the years who come from that part of the world. It's rare, but they come from that part of the world. And I always ask them, I said, are you moving back? And the answer is almost always no. Not until I'm old, not until I'm a retired person. I, I don't want to go back. There's nothing for me, effectively. And uh, that, that's true. So, But Texas geography has uh, been a long sweep. And after this, uh, we pick up with Spanish history and Spanish Texas history. And we start our slog and our, our march through uh, Spanish history, uh, Texas and Mexico's, Mexican Texas history, and then eventually to the Texas Revolution. Thank you. And we'll see you next time.